Hello and welcome everyone to the Feelin' Film Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron White, fresh back on the ground in Seattle, Washington after my trip to the Toronto International Film Festival. You are here for reviews that are simple, short, and spoiler-free, so that's what you're going to get. In this series, I will be speaking about the films that I saw at TIFF 2023. Some of these do not have release dates yet. Others do. I'll let you know when I can what those are. But thank you for coming along for this journey. I hope that I can introduce you to some interesting and exciting new films to keep your eye out for. So without further ado, let's get into the reviews. For this episode, I have a couple of film titles that are a little bit weird and awkward to say when you're having a conversation out and about with people, but that being said, they're still both very, very good films, and those titles both have an appropriate meaning with regards to these films and their plots. The first one is a movie that I almost didn't go see, I'll be honest. It wasn't really on my radar. It's about three British teenage girls and their partying and their goals to get laid. And I just wasn't sure if this was something that was going to be made for someone like me, um, if I would be the right person to review this. But having seen it now, I'm really glad that I checked it out. The movie's called How to Have Sex, and it's being distributed by Mubi. It stars Mia McKenna-Bruce, Laura Peake, Sean Thomas, Samuel Bottomley, Inva Lewis, Laura Ambler, and Anna Antonidis. It is written and directed by Molly Manning Walker. Cinematography is by Nicholas Caniccioni. It is edited by Finn Oates, and music is by Jack Wobb. It runs 98 minutes, and it's not rated yet, but it does have a content advisory for sexual violence, drug use, crude content, coarse language, and strobes and strobing effects. What's it about? Three British teenage girls go on a rites of passage holiday, drinking, clubbing, and hooking up in what should be the best summer of their lives. This was really an unexpected revelation for me. I went in thinking that this was just going to be a party film and wasn't going to have anything of value to say. And to be fair, The film does essentially take place in a series of parties, but it evolves into something painfully realistic as a coming-of-age tale that left me reeling by the end. It's a very high-energy, it's very propulsive style of filmmaking with a blaring EDM soundtrack and score constantly going on in the background, but It has a surprisingly strong and important message. The story follows three 16-year-old girls, Tara, Skye, and M. Tara also goes by the nickname Taz. They are in a place of excitement. They're graduating one level of schooling, and they're setting off on this trip to Greece full of debauchery, planning on having the time of their lives. They're considered best friends. They talk about how they never want to be separated, but yet there's this looming question about where they'll go to school in the next year that is is a constant throughout the movie. They have taken exams. Some of them are smarter or more educationally minded than others, and so there are nerves and anxiety around who will get into this specific school and who won't, and whether or not that will split them up as a group. Now, on this journey of partying, the primary goal for Tara, who is a virgin, is to get laid. And that's sort of the central driving force of all of the action. Eventually, the girls do get to this resort area in Greece, and they link up with some more vacationers in a room next door They start going to parties, they start hanging out, they start pairing off into twosomes and romantic-ish or sexual-driven relationships start to form 
and things begin to slowly start to get out of hand, the film ratchets up that tension in a way that is not like a horror movie, I would say, but you're constantly feeling in your gut this worry that you kind of know these girls are playing with fire and they're living right on the edge and everything is presented with such an incredible authenticity like it's a lived in experience from the writer herself or the director and writer and and you wonder what's going to happen like you feel those nerves that it could just go all south for these girls at any given moment a large portion of this is kind of dealing with their friendship dynamic as well and what it means to be a friend what it means to be a best friend is that someone who just gives you clothes to wear to make you look sexy before you head out to the club at night? Is that someone who encourages you to sleep with the person that you just met the night before? Uh, Is that someone who is dismissive of your concerns or the things that you, the little hints that you drop about situations that might not be going what you would consider to be safe? Is this person someone that pushes you into that or pulls you away from it? and is protective of you. We get to see a lot of that going on here. And there's questions. It, it's up for debate. Like, how good of a friend group is this? And how should friends act when they're out and about and on their own in a situation like this where all they have to rely on is each other? The performances are all very strong, but Mia McKenna Bruce as Taz is superb. She's a future star. I, I was blown away by her ability to capture this facade of strength and this character who acts like she has it all under control, pretending to be 18, 19, 20 years old. But yet at the same time, there's an emotional vulnerability and occasionally a very childlike innocence that comes out of her character. She is the central character and it's a performance and a, a plot dynamic that I think will resonate with many, many women um, who have probably experienced something similar to what Taz goes through. Now, there's a specific choice at the end of this movie that is very bold, and I found it extremely frustrating at first. In fact, I walked out of the theater almost with my hands up in the in the air because I had really enjoyed this movie. It m- was pretty special, and then this choice left me confused as to why the director would make it that way. But what happened is it encouraged me to seek out conversation. I started talking with other filmgoers. I started talking with women and getting different perspectives on this ending and the situation that had played out. And I learned a lot about the realistic nature of what we see on screen. And so, yes, it's bold, but it is equal parts hopeful and heartbreaking. And I think that it nails that natural, real-life experience that Manning Walker is portraying throughout this picture. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. This is a tough one to recommend somewhat because of the sexual violence that does occur at one point in the movie. I think that it's shot in a very respectful manner. We don't see the act happening itself zoomed in on. Instead, we see the reaction of the people involved in the sexual situations in this movie. And it's powerful stuff. And I honestly think it would be a fantastic talking point for families with teenagers, both boys and girls, to have a discussion about what could happen when they're out on their own, surrounded by other people of their age with nothing on their mind, but losing their senses via alcoholic consumption, partying, and with sex as their priority. I think there is something to be said about how teenagers can experience some freedom and some level of enjoyment and still be safe. But there's a very thin line there to where you're putting yourself into a dangerous situation and you have to think about that. You have to plan for that and you have to be surrounded by people 
that are willing to take care of you at all costs, even if that means less enjoyment for them in a specific moment. This is a really, really excellent film. It has no release date in the U.S. yet, but it is coming to theaters in the U.K. on November the 3rd, so I suspect it will be brought over to the States fairly shortly after that with Movie as the distributor. At the very least, we can expect it to eventually show up on their platform. And yeah, this was one of the surprises of TIFF for me, one of my top three, four films of the entire festival. Um, I hope that people will get a chance to see this and I'm really excited to see what this director does in the future and especially what Mia McKenna Bruce uh, gets to do next as an actress because again just an absolute knockout of a performance. The next film is called Daddy-O. Uh, this has not yet been acquired but it feels very much like the kind of movie that an A24 neon or a movie would pick up so I would put my money on that if I was a betting man. It stars Dakota Johnson and Sean Penn. And that's all. It is written and directed by Christy Hall. Cinematography is by Faden Papamichael. It is edited by Lisa Zeno Churgan. And music is by Dickon Hinchliff. It runs 91 minutes and is rated R for language throughout, sexual material, and brief graphic nudity. What's it about? A woman taking a cab ride from JFK engages in a conversation with the taxi driver about the important relationships in their lives. Now, on the surface, this feels like a very simple movie. I mean, it is exactly what that premise that I just read is. Dakota Johnson gets in a cab straight out of the airport. Sean Penn is her driver, and he takes her home. That's it. They drive from point A to point B. Nothing else from a plot development action standpoint happens but yet it's incredibly emotionally complex because of the conversations that the two engage in during this lengthy cab ride they talk about power dynamics and gender dynamics they talk about the influence of technology on our lives they talk about tipping culture they talk about past relationships loss sex all sorts of things and the conversation progresses to slowly become one where they are more comfortable and vulnerable with each other and begin to open up and talk more about their actual lives. We learn about the woman's past, her family situations and relationships. We learn about her romantic involvements. Uh, the graphic nudity, I'll throw this out there for you. It is a picture on a cell phone sent to the woman. I'll let you use your imagination to think about what that could possibly be. Uh, but it is not Dakota Johnson or Sean Penn, the actors themselves. So it's just a brief image on a cell phone screen. That's what the graphic nudity that we're talking about here is. We also learn about the man's home life as well as his past. Christy Hall has said that this was meant to be a love letter to the foul mouth and kind of rough around the edges, New York cabbie. And Sean Pym plays that role absolutely perfectly, and this captures that to a T. His ability to get the woman talking and to get her reflecting on her own life is really impressive. I, I know that I was a little bit anxious at first throughout the film because I, I was taking a lot of Ubers uh, during my time at TIFF, and so I was in a lot of cars. And I kept thinking about this movie. I don't know that I'll ever take another cab or Uber without having this film on my mind. Because sometimes you don't want to talk. Sometimes you just want to sit there and be silent and be on your phone. And that is shown here in a way in the film that sometimes you get a driver who really just wants to talk and engage with you. And it's interesting the kinds of things that you can discover kind of connections you can find between the two of you with this stranger if you allow yourself to open up and take part in those. Performances are both exceptional. It's got that feeling of a stage play because it is just a two-hander. The chemistry between the actors is off the charts, and it's not romantic or sexual chemistry. It's just two people who have the ability to communicate subtly using body language to convey things that are not specifically said, 
and to naturally just engage in this level of deep conversation um, on a spur of the moment with a stranger. Shockingly, all of the scenes shot in a cab, which is about 95% of the movie, were actually filmed on a soundstage. I was blown away by that because you never, ever think that was the case while watching this. It has outstanding cinematography for being such a sing simple, single-location movie. There's gorgeous shots of the passing nighttime traffic and the looming New York skyline. And in particular, one thing that stood out to me was the way in which they utilized the rearview mirror often throughout the film to show one character's perspective or point of view of what the other is seeing. And so you would have Sean Penn seeing Dakota Johnson talking to him through the rearview mirror. It's just a very realistic way to do it, uh, but the way they shot it, it looks fantastic. And I think it adds a little bit of flair to what can be just such a straightforward film with one person in the back seat, one person in the front seat, not a lot of movement, just a bunch of talking. This is one of the more confident and precise feature directorial debuts that I've ever seen. Hall has a vision and she executes it perfectly. It's a story about reflecting on life, about being present in the moment and realizing that you never know when another person might be a part of or a catalyst for meaningful change in your life if only you're willing to listen, to open up, and to be honest. daddy -o, the title actually will come into play as well. You'll learn what that means or why that is part of this film during the course of it. I don't know that it's the best name for this movie, to be honest. I think it makes sense afterwards, but it's I don't know if it's the best selling point for what this story is. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, no distribution yet, so no date in sight for when you'll be able to get a chance to see this. But definitely keep it on your radar. Now you've heard about it. Hopefully when you see a trailer for this pop up or some article online saying that it's been acquired and it has a release date, you'll take note and get a chance to enjoy Christy Hall's film because it is really, really wonderful one. Well, that's it for this episode of TIFF Reviews on Feelin' Film Podcast. Hope you've enjoyed listening and or watching this. If you are enjoying the show, please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Seek me out on social media. You can find links to all the socials in the show notes to each and every episode. I'll be back for a while. Still a whole lot of TIFF movies to go through, plus regular new release reviews to drop as well. So you'll be seeing a lot of me. Until the next time, keep watching and keep feeling filmed.